Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for um, getting up early and making time to come and listen this morning. So, uh, yeah, look, I'm going to talk a little bit more on the on the sinister and uh, and um, uh, downside of things. So, you know, where uh, Sam was talking about the um, fourth industrial revolution, you know, talking about Internet of Things, so many things connected to the internet. Um, it's fantastic, and the possibilities are amazing. Uh, for us cynics in the in the um, security industry, this makes us incredibly nervous. Um, the more things that are connected to the web, um, the less secure they are, the bigger the attack surface um, for the people that are out there. So um, look, my talk today uh, is a, a mix of some of our experience with the customers we work with and the stuff we see uh, out in the real world, a little bit about um, disinformation and how that's used uh, both by people pushing their own agenda and by hackers. Uh, and, and we're really fortunate to have a, an interview with Robbie Mook. So um, I'll talk a little bit about Robbie in a minute, but um, as Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, um, had some really interesting insights into what it's like um, to go through that sort of situation. So before I start, though, just to dispel a few common misconceptions about hackers uh, and what they are. So uh, my team that I work with, uh, they are called ethical hackers. Um, which sounds like a slightly unusual term, but essentially what these guys and girls do, they've got um, the same tools and techniques that hackers use, and they try and hack into people's uh, networks and, and applications and see if they can get the information that they need. Uh, but the perception of hackers and what they are and how they function for a long time has been <clears throat> similar to the picture you see up there. So an individual uh, with a hoodie on in mum's basement, uh, up all hours of the night, uh, trying to find ways into your network. So that picture of the hacker, while there are still some of those sorts of people uh, highly technically proficient and, and really uh, enjoying what they do at that level, uh, while that exists, that picture has really shifted over the last few years. So we no longer see <clears throat> hackers as individuals um, just trying to um, hack a number of, of smaller accounts for large amounts of money. We now see hackers uh, working in, in organizations, so large criminal organizations. Uh, they span countries. They're very organized. Um, they, uh, they have um, goals, they have financial goals that they're trying to hit every year. They look for different techniques of how they'll approach attacks. They look for the easiest way to carry out an attack, so they're trying to save as much money as they can. The faster they can do it, the better they can get a return on, uh, on their investment. Um, believe it or not, they have contact centers, so if you're ever ransomware and you've never paid a ransom before, they've got very helpful contact centers, and they will walk you through how to do that. So this idea that um, they're very unorganized and they don't, um, you know, they're just going to try and hit random targets, that is no longer the case. Um, they are constantly looking at ways um, to break into systems and how they get hold of your information. And there's, there's a primary reason for that. Their main reason for that is financial. So there is a lot of money to be made by stealing data and selling that on the dark web. But there are other groups um, who are not just financially focused. So there are groups who are interested in the politics of the day, and there are groups who are interested in how they manipulate society. And there are some fantastic tools now at their disposal to do that in social media uh, and in the changes that we're seeing in technology and how they can be used to create uh, fake information and fake news. So just a, a little bit about, about Aura uh, before I start, and I always um, do this quickly so I can give myself a little bit of credibility to stand up here and, and talk. Uh, so yeah, um, we were founded in uh, 2006, so we've been around for 13 years. We're the oldest and largest um, uh, security company in New Zealand at the moment. Um, and we look at these main areas when we uh, look at um, how customers are being secured. So we look at people, we look at their physical environments, and we look at their technology. Now, what's interesting over the last few years is the people component has really become one of the main areas of focus. Uh, like I said before, hackers are trying to find the easiest way into organizations, and they're trying to find the quickest and simplest way to make money. And what they've started to realize is it's actually quite easy to manipulate people and get them to do certain things for them uh, that gets them the goal that they're after. So uh, if they can spend six weeks writing some code that's going to get them into a system, they could do that. But if they're going to spend 24 hours uh, writing up some really good uh, phishing emails and sending those through, or maybe uh, calling your contact center and trying to get them to 
uh, change a password so that they can get onto a system, that's much faster, it's much easier, and they're going to try that path of least resistance. So that focus on, on people and the role of people within your business to keep you secure has become more and more important. Um, at Aura, we also um, sort of wrap all of those things together. So we do what we call red teaming engagements. Uh, and this is really um, a replay of how hackers behave in the, in the wild. So uh, if you've got something within your business that is really precious to you and you really want to protect, um, a hacker's not going to work to a scope. He's not going to say, well, I can only do a technical attack, so I'm not going to try anything else. Um, he'll find any way to get into your organization. And so that's what we do with red teaming attacks. We look at your business and we go, well, what's the best way um, to get into your organization? How do we get uh, your most important information? And we make our way through that. And most often, again, that is through the people in your business. And we'll spend some time on social media. We'll get to know who's in your organization. We'll get to know what their roles are. Um, and we'll utilize that information to find our way into the business. Now, this uh, gathering of information uh, and this intelligence uh, that we use, uh, this is what we start to see in this disinformation war, is uh, how do um, people who want to change the social conversation or people who want to hack into your accounts, how do they look at what's going on in the market at the moment and how do they make a change uh, and, and get where they want to go? So look, we're going to listen uh, to Robbie Mook in a second. So, um, so that is Robbie. So uh, Robbie was the um, presidential campaign uh, manager for Hillary Clinton's 2016 uh, presidential campaign. Now, I've got to say, uh, you know, we all watch that um, in a mixture of uh, disbelief and horror and <laughs> didn't quite know what was going on in that campaign because we'd never seen a campaign like this before. And the reason we hadn't seen a campaign like this before was the role that digital assets had to play. So um, misinformation, uh, manipulation of news, um, hacks of emails, it, this was all new. This is stuff we'd seen in pockets in uh, different parts of society, uh, but we'd never seen it pull together in such an interesting way as we did during that campaign. And, uh, and Robbie was at the center of this. And um, so I'm gonna play you a first bit of his interview where he talks about some of his experiences in the campaign, uh, and, then, um, and then we'll have a chat about um, some of those uh, instances. Well, first of all, information operations are a real thing. So this concept that someone can either spread things that aren't true or steal your information and release it to the public selectively or doctored, however, uh, that that is a thing that can happen to you. And it can fundamentally undermine your character or people's trust in you. But I would actually say the biggest shift was between 2008 and Obama's re-elect in 2012, when social media really was king. You know, it's, it's crazy to think about, but Facebook wasn't a thing we had to use. Twitter wasn't around. By 2012, all of these platforms were there. They were robust. And so we saw, for example, with Twitter, that the, um, you know, we have the spin room after debates so while the operatives go in and talk to the reporters and try to spin them on what happened. That wasn't particularly relevant anymore because Twitter created a spin room that was going on during the debate. So by the time you physically got into that spin room, the spinning had already happened. Reporters had moved on. Um, so that, that was a, I think that was a pretty fundamental shift in how we interact with, with the earned media. Um, I think in 2016, what was new, and this was this was a, a focus for us early on, actually, was not just how do we create good content, but how do we get that content shared? How do we deliver that out? We saw new innovations in doing this and in, in, um, creating different kinds of um, content that people would be more interested in sharing. I think we also saw the dark side of this, where content was getting pushed out there that was bad, that was fake, false, wrong, misleading, and so on that was getting shared quite widely. Um, and so if we think about, let's say 2004 to 2012, we have these new platforms arise, a new way of doing things. I think we're now in a place where technology will continue to evolve. The mobile phone came on the scene during all this, but now the question is, 
whew, how do we manage all of this? Now that it is an integral part of our lives, how do, we, how do we leverage the good, which we were pretty focused on for a few years, but now how do we also mitigate the bad? I think the most damaging part of both the emails being released and also some of the fake news is that it all fed into this single narrative around her emails and dishonesty and mistrust and so on. And what happened was it all fed into one big story when in fact there were a bunch of different things. So people thought, for example, Hillary Clinton's email had been hacked by the Russians and released out. That, that wasn't true, but you would see headlines about that every day. And so what I think was particularly clever about what the Russians did is they'd take things that were in the news already and put together fake headlines or fake information about it that seemed reasonable given the context or they were about emails. So, oh, it's just another headline about her emails. Of course, that's true. Um, there was one very famous one about the, uh, the Republican that was running the Benghazi investigation, which was obviously totally overblown. You know, they, were, they could just put out a headline saying, he's got her now. They finally found the secret of, the, of how she broke the law. Totally untrue, but really hard to go back, to wheel that back, because in fact that person is out there talking about an investigation into her. Oh. <clears throat> so as you can imagine in the in the middle of that campaign um, suddenly dealing with all of this fake news so so you know they were interested in using the vehicle of um, digital media and and so uh, we've got a lot of social media suddenly available uh, for this campaign so how do we send things out via Twitter and Facebook and how do we make that work for us and and uh, and how do we um, help the press you know he's talking about um, you know the press that already formed decisions before they even got into that um, room to, to have their conferences. So it was a real change in how they did this. But what you see is the other side, or, or you know, he talks about the and the Russian impact on the on the elections, um, saying, well, hey, actually, there's a way we can use this to um, push things to our advantage and to and to change things and, and make things work for us. So um, you know, so the first image there. So so this is uh, something we've we're probably used to seeing is is photoshopped images, uh, and some of them are really easy to really easy to spot, um, like that one, uh, and some of them less so. So, you know, how do you take something that feels real in the media, you know? Um, there, there was that news that, oh, Hillary's uh, not well, or it looks like she, she tripped and stumbled when she got out of her car. Um, so, so you've seen that on, on mainstream media, and, and suddenly you've got the National Enquirer um, running a, a spin story that looks really different. So. Um, how do you how do you counter that? How do you um, say that that's not um, that that's not true? Um, and then of course you've got um, you've got uh, Facebook and Twitter and and they're putting out um, articles as well. And um, and suddenly people are going, well, is this real or not? Am I looking at something um, that the press has created, or am I looking at something um, that someone else has created? And so what's interesting with social media is, um, you know, we, if we go to a, a newspaper, so we go pick up um, the Herald, um, you're going to look at that and go, oh, this is, um, this is sourced information. These are reporters. They've got a level of ethics that they're required to adhere to. So I feel reasonably confident that um, this is the right thing and I'm being told the truth here. Um, with this kind of information on, on social media, uh, you've got people going, well, do I, do I trust this or not? So you're going to treat this with a healthy sense of skepticism. But what we've got in social media is um, you've already got a situation of trust. So if you've got a friend uh, on Facebook and they've seen an article about um, national anthems being banned, uh, and they're quite patriotic. They might go, "Oh, this is just so. This is something Obama would do. I'm, I'm posting that." So they're going to put that on their Facebook page. You've got a relationship with that person already on their um, on the Facebook page. So you go, "Well, um, this sounds plausible, and maybe this is something uh, that's real because you know Sally's posted it or Bob's posted it." So. Um, yeah, I'm going to repost that. So we find um, through that chain of trust, people reposting these articles uh, and then getting further and further out into the into the community. Um, you know, some of them uh, are obviously fake, but you think about the impact uh, a news item like that coming through on uh, BBC's uh, feed would have. I mean, we've seen um, similar articles. So there was a. Um, 
during the Obama presidency, his Twitter feed was hacked, and uh, and there were two, or the White House Twitter feed, sorry, and there were two articles put up, one saying that there'd been an explosion in the White House, and then a second one going up saying the president was harmed uh, during it but had survived. Um, and if you watch the um, American share market at the time when those two tweets went up, there's this enormous dip in the middle of the day just when those tweets went up. Then it turned out they were fake and, and that was reported and the market bounced back again. So if you wanted to be cynical, you could say if you wanted to manipulate the market, what a fantastic opportunity. You wait till the market drops, you buy a bunch of shares, a few hours later the market bounces back up again. Hey, you know, you got some cheap shares, um, great way to make some money. So this sort of manipulation of social media to impact uh, the market or the pol political landscape, selling people going, hey, this is a, this is a great idea. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, about Pizzagate at some point as well, but uh, you know, Pizzagate became a big thing during the, during the Clinton campaign too, so this constant uh, murmuring uh, underground that there were issues in the campaign, they were dishonest. Uh, and these continue, you know, um, Sam's point around the Obama um, birth certificate thing, 30% of Americans still believe that. And this stuff just perpetuates and it keeps on going and it keeps being fed by these articles being online. Now this isn't new, uh, you know, fake news and stuff being made up and put out to the public isn't new. So, uh, you know, when I was prepping for this, I did some research into sort of how far back does fake news go, and it goes it goes really far back. So I found a really interesting article on uh, Mark Antony um, when he was uh, running a political political campaign in the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, he had one of his opponents um, create a whole bunch of fake news about what he'd been up to and how disloyal he was to the Roman Empire and, and, and spread that around Rome uh, and really destroyed his political campaign uh, in that case. So, you know, that's pretty far back. Um, Benjamin Franklin, um, during the American War of Independence as well, uh, he realised he needed to get people's sympathy on side, so he wrote a bunch of fake articles and published them uh, that the British were paying uh, Native Americans to scalp uh, American settlers and were giving them money for those scalps, uh, and that was published. And so, you know, people were going, "Oh, yeah, yeah, this, uh, you know, these British are terrible, and we've got to fight against them." So, um, this sort of fake news has been going around for a while. The most interesting one um, that I found though was was uh, during World War One and, and World War Two, and this shows how. Um, the press, or, or sorry, uh, people will manipulate things in the press. So you heard Robbie talk about stuff that sort of seemed true and then they add some extra flavour to it and so suddenly people are not sure, well, is this true or not? So during the First World War, uh, the British published articles in the press um, to say that the Germans were capturing uh, British soldiers and taking them to these camps and were turning them into glue and nitroglycerin and doing all sorts of things with them. So this was, you know, this was, went in the papers and, and, and of course the British were outraged and this was horrific. First World War ended and, and it came out and they said, oh, you know, it was all fake and, and we made this up to try and change sentiment. And so when the Second World War came along and the first article started to leak out about the Holocaust and what was going on in the, in the Jewish concentration camps, suddenly the public was like, well, is this real or not? Because we've seen the government do this before and try and stir us up. So do we believe this information or, or don't we? And of course, in the end, it turned out it was true, but it spurred uh, so much debate around uh, whether it's true or not. And like I say, this stuff persists. So you, you find Holocaust deniers still today who say, well, we, we don't know if we can really believe it. So. Um, this uh, fake news and this idea of uh, um, how things can be manipulated has been going on for a long time. The difference we've got now is the changes in technology. So where people would go, well, I'll believe it if I see it. Um, you know, well, if you're seeing Donald Trump rescuing people from a, from a boat, your logic tells you it's probably not true. But hey, you know, people will point to that and go, look, that's an image that I can see. And if I can see it, I can believe it. And so... While we're seeing, um, you know, the, the sorts of um, uh, photoshopped images and, and, and changes to, to content we've seen for a while, they were still a bit sceptical skeptical about those, yeah, maybe, maybe not. So the next thing that's coming from a techno technology perspective is uh, what we call deep fakes. And so the technology is now in place where we can manipulate video to make it look like someone is saying and doing things uh, that they shouldn't be. So I'm going to play you a, a deep fake video now, um, and, and it's, uh, 
purported to be, you know, uh, President Obama um, speaking. Um, thank you very much, Sam, for bleeping out the inappropriate uh, words that appear in this uh, particular item. But um, uh, really interesting to see uh, what it looks like and how many people believed this when it came out. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dip Now. You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of f***ed up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, f***ers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, obviously, um, <laughs> things that um, President Obama would never say. But that's a, an extreme example uh, of the sorts of things someone would say. So you can Im imagine a more subtle example. You want to put out uh, an announcement that, um, you know, Trump has said something or <coughs> Theresa May has said something or Putin has said something. You know, it it's fairly simple to recreate this. So the technology is there. Essentially, the way it works is they feed in uh, a number of items um, with this particular person. Uh, the technology looks for the for the voice and, and how that voice sounds and is put together. It looks for um, how they move and uh, particular nuances to their facial features. So it needs a fair bit of in initial information fed in. But from a public figure, and there are a lot of uh, sources for that information. Once the information is in the system, you can say whatever you want uh, and it'll look like that person saying it. So what we're going to end up with is people looking at the sort of information and going, well, do I trust it? Um, uh, is this real? And we're going to find the opposite as well. So potentially real information and people actually saying some pretty damning or, or hurtful things, uh, it's going to be on the flip. And they're going to say, well, this isn't real and this is faked and I never said that. So we're suddenly in a situation where, um, you know, how does this work and, and are we being manipulated? So why would people um, waste their time and go the trouble of... Um, of putting these sorts of, of things together. So um, there's a really good reason uh, to start to create these items because uh, it can be used to change public opinion. Uh, it can be used to generate funds through marketing. It can be used uh, to attack people uh, and, their, and their email accounts, for example. So um, I'll talk briefly about uh, how these sorts of things are used for what we call clickbait. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Hillary Clinton's emails and, and how that hack occurred um, and, uh, and how that information was, was used, or at least, the, sorry, the campaign emails. So um, we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of these sorts of videos being used for what we call clickbait. So the way clickbait works, um, the hackers look at what's interesting in the news, what's topical, what are people talking about. So um, I found a bunch of clickbait when I was researching this uh, around Melania Trump. So I don't know if any of you know this particular conspiracy theory, but there's a conspiracy theory that Melania Trump, when you see her out with Donald Trump, isn't always Melania Trump. So there's this theory that she has a body double, and if she doesn't feel like going out with him, her body double goes out instead, and, uh, you know, and... Um, she can stay at home and, and chill out, I guess. Uh, so this has sort of gained a little bit of interest online. So what we see um, the hackers do is they'll create an article that says, you know, uh, similar to the sort of stuff Robbie was talking about. So Melania Trump, the truth about the body double, you know, we've got the facts, and uh, everyone goes, oh, my God, this is so interesting, and they click the link. 
So that link uh, is going to do one of a few things, depending on what the hacker is interested in. So um, you're going to click the link that's going to potentially download some malware to your to your computer if you don't um, if you don't run a good uh, antivirus system on, on your on your uh, computer. You could easily get a little bit of malware in there, even things like keystroke logging that's just looking at what you're doing on your machine. Um, so that could be one option. The other option it could say uh, this article's on Facebook. Um, here you go, log into your Facebook account, please. So you can put in your username and password for your Facebook account, and they'll then pass you through to Facebook or, or a similar looking page, and you'll think you've logged in. Actually, all they've done is harvested your credentials in the background, and they're going to reuse those either to log into an account, your own account, and, and try and um, reach your, your friends, or to see whether you use the same password on your other accounts, and um, can they get into other accounts and, and do some damage. Um, so these are a couple of the of the options that they're looking at uh, of how can they how can they use that link. The the other one uh, that we often see um, with clickbait is to um, is to get you to click on an item that uh, is going to um, lead on to a relationship with someone online. So uh, as in a, a business relationship, so you can chat to someone uh, and they seem to be genuine, and then maybe even start some email conversations. So. Hackers are often looking at um, how do they gain access to your network, and emails are a really, really good way to do that because uh, there's a lot of information in emails, um, there's a lot of conversation and interaction going on in emails, uh, and if they can get those, um, they can find out a lot about your, your business. So in the case of the Clinton campaign, uh, what we saw was what's called a spear phishing attack. So um, the Russian hackers who um, got into their accounts they decided the best way was to reach out to a number of people within the campaign and see if they could get them to click a link. So they created some emails that looked genuine. Now remember, um, you know, Sam talked at the start about the amount of emails that are floating around in the web. I was doing some work with a customer a few weeks ago. You know, their business, they, they get 17,000 emails through their business a day. This is a company here in Auckland. Uh, 10,000 of those are, are spam or, or malicious. So you've got... Um, People in the campaign dealing with thousands of emails coming through on their desk every day. A lot of these are going to look uh, genuine. A lot of them could be strange. A lot of them will have attachments. So um, emails come in. They click a link. Um, they go and have a look at what's in there. It might, might have looked fine when it came in, uh, but a small bit of malware attached to that uh, and into their machine. So there were two pieces of malware that rode through on those emails. So one uh, was a keystroke logger. So what a keystroke logger allows you to do is as people type, uh, it'll capture <clears throat> that information. So if you want to capture passwords, if you want to capture account details, things like that, that's really good to do through a keystroke logger. And the other thing it had was a piece of exfiltration uh, software on there. So it would gather information and send that out of the system to the attackers. And that's where they gather that information from. Once they had the information, so here's where you know whether someone's after money or not. Uh, what do they do with the information once they've got it? So they didn't sell it. Uh, it went to WikiLeaks, and that information was, was published. And so then off the back of that, off the back of that information, uh, there were suddenly a bunch of theories around, you know, what's going on in this information, and what does this mean, and what is the campaign doing, and what are their members up to. So, you know, the um, Pizzagate one uh, that came up earlier, that was an interesting one. So this was uh, one of the members of uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign. The emails were hacked. Those were published on, on WikiLeaks. And then people started going, oh, you know, there's a code in this email, and it's actually a, a pedophile ring, and they're trading children for sex, and it's being done through um, various restaurants around the city, and, and this pizza parlor is the central part of it. And so this theory was cooked up and then through social media and through the sorts of articles we saw earlier, this was pushed out into the public space. So suddenly you've got, um, you know, and Robbie will talk about this shortly, he's running a campaign uh, for uh, a presidential candidate, but on the flip side, he's now got um, some really weird stuff, which he's probably going and said, well, who's going to believe that? Floating around out there, and suddenly there's articles about it, and they look genuine, and they're on people's Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds, and they now gain some legitimacy because people are passing them on, and it fuels this conspiracy theory idea. Um, and that's very hard to, to damp down, and, and, and Robbie will talk shortly about you know, when do you respond and when don't you respond? You know, if, if someone's 
posting some fake news, do you respond to that and say, hey, that's fake news because now you've just drawn attention to it? And people are going to go, oh, well, now that he's talking about it, well, it must be real because he's trying to cover up for it. And then that'll spawn a whole bunch of, uh, of other fake news articles. So a little bit before we hear um, from Robbie again, just a bit about why hackers do what they do. So the vast majority of attacks are for money. Um, so the stats last year, and look, they're not formal because while well, these guys are a bit more organized, they still don't file tax returns. But um, the stats globally show um, last year through cybercrime, around about a trillion dollars um, went through cybercrime, so uh, around the world. Uh, a big chunk of that is, is things like ransomware. Um, and, uh, and people using spear phishing and people using fake invoices and scamming organizations to get hold of their information. Um, but we certainly see, uh, you know, in this case, 26% being politically motivated. So we've got groups of what we call hacktivists. So these are groups like Anonymous, uh, and they're very interested in getting into people's accounts uh, and finding the information they're after and, and either publishing that or manipulating it online. So I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was an organization called Ashley Madison. It's interesting to see they're actually, they're still operating. But uh, Ashley Madison was for people who wanted to cheat on their partners and find other people who wanted to cheat on their partners too and, and hook up. So a group uh, of hacktivists decided that didn't sound like a great idea. So they hacked the, uh, um, the website, they grabbed the whole database and they published um, the database of, of all the uh, members on the, on the site. So um, if you're a member, your name went up there. Interestingly, uh, the New Zealand um, people on there that we looked at, people seem to like to use their business email addresses um, for these sorts of accounts. So it was interesting to see what companies they come from. It's a fair few from, from government organisations as well. Um, <laughs> some of those could be fake as well. There were a number of John Keys in that list. So. Um, <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a number of reasons why hackers do the attacks they do. The, the majority of them, though, are very focused on the financial rewards. So if you look at um, data theft and how that's reused um, and sold through the dark web, so uh, if you've got what we call fools, so fools is full information on a person, so that includes your name and date of birth, some of your credit and banking details, um, you can get anywhere between sort of 6 and $12 per entry um, for that sort of information. So if you look at some of the larger scale attacks, if you're stealing 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 um, usernames and passwords and, and the details, you're selling those for 10, 11 bucks a go. You can sell them multiple times. You put them in lists and, and resell them and resell them. There's a lot of money to be made. So um, most hackers are motivated by, by money, but we certainly do see um, groups that are motivated by, by political gain and particularly uh, our nation state hackers, so countries like Russia and, and North Korea, China, and we see a lot of that work on. Obviously, the UK and the US um, you know, have nation state hacking as well, and where they're trying to get one up on the, on the other side. And, uh, and the resources at their disposal is much higher than any of the other hacker groups. Um, they're far more targeted, uh, and they can do some real damage in, in what they do. So um, I'm going to play the second part of the um, conversation with, with Robbie Merck, and, and uh, the reason we split this up into the second section is, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the problem, and what it looks like, um, how damaging that can be for your business. So in the second section, he talks a bit about what you should be doing as an organisation to try and be a bit safer, uh, what you should be looking for, and the sorts of things they had to deal with and do um, to try and shut some of that down. What happened on a campaign? It's been a long time strategy of the Russians in particular, but now there's a proof of concept, others can do it. And I believe in the private sector that some companies, particularly in countries where the national security apparatus and the intelligence apparatus and the corporate space are somewhat combined, this could be a way for a company to seek advantage as we become more globalized and, and integrated. Um, if, if, if a big company that does one thing in one company or in one country wants to go after another, this is, this is something it could have. And they could have the state intelligence and security apparatus collaborate with them to do that. So I, I think the 2016 election isn't just a wake-up call for Democrats or for political people. I think it's a wake-up call for everybody that you are a potential victim. 
your organization must have a strategy about what data you keep, what data you don't, how you secure that data, who has access to that data. And you need to create a culture in the organization where you protect uh, your information. Um, uh, in terms of fake news and misinformation that's out there, um, I believe the most important thing any organization can do is build a credible, authentic brand for themselves. And so in politics, I think every politician needs to seek to have that credible, authentic voice, and particularly that people wanna share, right? Because you want people to share the good things you're putting out. And as a company, you want people to share those stories too. But that credible, authentic, uh, voice is the most powerful weapon you can have to counteract that information operation. And it's, and it's a real thing. It actually has to be authentic. It has to be rooted in a true mission and a set of values and a consistent, clear, authentic articulation of those things. I think the Clintons for decades had been subject to rumors in tabloid magazines and in the online space as well. I think what we didn't appreciate was how quickly those could move in social media and how how they really could have a persuasive effect on people. Uh, in my experience on campaigns for the years before, if you saw things moving around on Twitter or there was something on a blog or a right-wing news site, you didn't like it and you tried to do something about it, but it, it, it wasn't gonna have a, a deeper impact on the campaign. That really happened here. It really, really happened. Um, and so we we imagined that people would spread rumors. I don't think we imagined that the fire could spread the way it did. I saw this so many times. If an idea gets out, um, if the media misreports or misrepresents something, and that will move very quickly on Twitter. And once that toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't really put it back in. And so strategically, you have to cut it off as quickly as possible. And I think that's the hardest thing. One of the hardest things for any campaign to do is to say, does this deserve a response? Do, do I need to go um, take care of this? Because obviously, when you do interact with an issue that way, you are going to get another round of stories saying that thing that wasn't true, FYI, it's not true, but they're hearing it again. And I really do think that is the hardest thing to figure out right now on a campaign. I'll give you an interesting example. There were some letters that were released on the letterhead of Hillary's doctor saying all kinds of crazy things. She was going to die tomorrow. She has some wacky brain disease or something like that. They were totally fake. And of course, they were getting pushed around all over the place by the alt-right. And we did make a decision. We have to intervene and say, say this is not true. And I remember being on Rachel Maddow's show, on, on her cable news show, and I was there to say these letters are fake. They're false. Uh, people need to ignore them. And, uh, and by the way, you know, talk about the letters that had been released that were accurate. And I remember Rachel Maddow asking me, why are you doing this? Why don't you just let it go? Why are you giving this more attention? And I remember just thinking it was such a surreal moment. Like, I'm talking about it because you all are talking about it. And if I don't talk about it, people will believe it. But this is the kind of swirl you can get caught in. And what's challenging is the campaign has, has only so much voice. And you want as much of that voice as possible talking about the proactive things that the voters need to hear about you. And, and this, at the end of the day, was one of our biggest problems on the campaign. Hillary talked about a lot of the right things, but nobody heard her. Because what was actually getting through is not what she said in her speech, it's not what we put in a press release, it's not what we released on social media. It was the negative things that were getting trafficked. And in some cases, our response to the negative things, that's what would get reported. So obviously, um, a really difficult situation to be in. Um, and again, unprecedented and, uh, uh, and not well planned for. You know, this wasn't something a campaign had dealt with before. So I've read some other articles by members of the, the Clinton campaign. When the Russian email attacks happened, they had some stuff in, plan, uh, in place that they planned for around potential intrusion and um, some hacking of their database. But, um, 
the planning around what you know what would they do if emails were hacked and information was released and and there were these massive sort of fake campaigns going on how do they communicate about it none of that had really been been planned for so um yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about what organisations can do if you're thinking about um, security for your business and you're thinking about how do you deal with that. So, I look, the, the first thing is to understand uh, your risk profile, um, to understand what the threats look like uh, for your organisation. So, we spend a lot of time with, uh, with our customers um, doing what we call um, threat modelling. So, um, who are you as an organisation? Um, what are the threats out there in the market that could affect you? Uh, and how do you formulate a plan around that? But the most important thing is, um, well, to have a plan, but also to um, treat cybersecurity risk like you treat any other risk. So, you know, we always use health and safety as a great example. If you go back a few years before Pike River, a lot of organisations would talk about health and safety. Um, it would sort of be on the agenda, but it didn't have a massive amount of attention. You look at organisations today, you know, health and safety is pretty central for, no, for most businesses. I know, you know, Cordia, it's a, it's a real central focus for us. Um, and, and that's been a real, a real change from a few years ago. So we're saying the same now with cybersecurity. So um, you need to understand the risk. And that doesn't mean you need to be a, a rocket scientist to, to get the cybersecurity stuff. The risks are the risks to your information as an organisation. It's not an IT risk alone. It's an organisation-wide risk. And you need to understand what that is. And then you need to develop a plan around that. Um, a roadmap is really important. How are you going to improve as an organisation? Uh, how do you um, get over some of these things? So, uh, you know, one of the things Robbie was talking about there was was this sort of swirl of communication. So, if you've got something fake out there about your organisation, so do you respond to that or don't you respond to that? If um, someone's saying you've you've been attacked and and information's been leaked, well, do you confirm that or do you deny it? So, a lot of organisations don't think about well, how am I going to respond to this until they're in the situation and then they're scrambling to put together a, a, a decent response. So. Um, something like a, a good comms plan or a media plan for how you respond to this kind of incident uh, is, is really important. Um, understanding uh, who's involved in your business uh, for, a, for a disaster response. You know, we say to a lot of organisations, uh, you can work as hard as you like at being secure, but unfortunately these days there is no such thing as 100% secure. So again, what you're doing is, is mitigating your, your security risk. So what you do need to think about is, so when that happens, when we have an intrusion or there's a breach or someone opens a ransom uh, email, well, how does that affect our systems and how do, we, how do we behave and how do we respond and who's here? You know, we've run exercises with customers where we, um, where we say, okay, you know, here's a, we, we do a, a round table uh, version of an incident happening and we talk through it. Uh, you know, and even simple things like, uh, okay, you need to get hold of uh, the person in charge of this area, the business, who's got their contact details. And 20 minutes later, people are still running around trying to find their contact details, you know. Okay, well now, now actually your situation's escalated because you've taken 20 minutes and some things have moved on. So now you're in a worse position. So just having some of that basic planning in place is really important. Um, the other side, and this is sort of to loop back to uh, what I said at the start, is around um, education for your, for your people. So. Um, it's a really good uh, slide that um, Sam found, but this is around uh, email subjects for um, emails coming through to staff. So as I said that at the start, you know, um, particularly phishing and spear phishing uh, are an incredibly popular way of, um, of hitting staff and getting through to, um, to your organisation. And the real technique here for attackers is not around the virus that they're deploying into your system or the malware that they're, that they're using. You know, a lot of that stuff exists already. So if I'm an attacker uh, and I actually have very little technical understanding, I can go and um, purchase that uh, malware online. You can, you can buy it on the dark web. Uh, it's actually not very expensive. Um, and so I don't really need to understand that much about the technology behind what I'm trying to do. If I'm trying to ransom your business, I can go get that ransomware. That's not hard. Um, the hard part is making sure that actually I've got one or two or five of your staff who are going to click on that link uh, and release the, um, the malware that I need them to release into the system. So what attackers do is they go, well, what, what's the best way for us to, to hit people? So um, very interesting there. I, I'm sure all of us are on LinkedIn, and we all get LinkedIn updates all the time. Uh, and so the attackers know that as well. Their business is really... Um, 
uh, invested in LinkedIn. And so you got 39% of the attacks being um, LinkedIn uh, emails. So if you get this email, it'll look like an email from LinkedIn. Uh, it, it'll have the same formatting, it'll have the branding on it. They often spoof the uh, address. So if you don't actually um, do some investigation into the uh, email address that it's come from, it'll look like it's come from LinkedIn, uh, and you're going to click through and, and uh, that's going to um, either download something or, or take you to a site where they're going to harvest your information. Um, you know, broader, uh, broader based um, phishing where you're just trying to hit as many people as you can. Things like, you know, free pizza or we've seen, uh, you know, um, click now and you'll get a 50% um, off on a day spa treatment and, you know, those sorts of things. People go, oh, that sounds good. There's always some urgency around it. You need to do it now and they're going to um, try and get you to, to do it. Um, Voice messages, so I had one of these a couple of days ago, um, saying, hey, you got a new voice message. Uh, click through and listen to your voice message. So what they're looking for is things that are part of your normal daily life. You're going to go, oh, yes, I'm expecting to hear something from LinkedIn. This makes sense. Or, uh, oh, sure, someone's left me a, a voicemail. I better, go, I better go have a look at that. Uh, and they're going to make you um, click on that link. Um, you know, you look at some of those attacks down there. I bet you you've had some of these in your mailbox. Um, that second from the bottom, Office 365, in the last six months, we've seen an explosion of those in the New Zealand market. So lots of organisations moving to 365, and the hackers have gone, this is a great example uh, of something we can take advantage of. Let's um, send out lots of uh, emails that go, hey, welcome to 365, and log into your account. Uh, and they're harvesting credentials, and we're seeing lots of email attack, uh, accounts being attacked off the back of that. Um, the attackers are also really, um, uh, you know, just looking for any advantage they can get out there. So Sam spoke at the start about the, the 15th of March Christchurch attacks. So straight after that, we saw a bunch of attacks coming through where the attackers were using that as the premise to get you to click. So here's a donation page. Here's an article about the attacks. Here's some more inside information. Have a read. Um, fake news about it. You know, more people have died. So these were going out straight after the attacks, really topical for the New Zealand public, and people were clicking through and, and using that information. So for us, the biggest difference you can make in your organisation is to educate your people. If you can get your staff to understand uh, what uh, phishing emails look like, and the impact clicking on these links can have to, you, to your business. If you can get them to understand what um, scam invoices look like and, and what they need to do with those. If you can get them to understand uh, from a help desk perspective how resetting passwords is going um, is to be really bad for, you, for your business if they don't know who the person is they're resetting the password for, um, you can make a huge difference to, to your organization. Um, so you, know, you look at uh, Hillary Clinton's emails, that was through a phishing attack that they got um, that information. So while the, um, the malware they used was, was relatively sophisticated, the actual attack was quite straightforward uh, and aimed at people. So if you can educate your people, um, you can make a really big difference to your organization. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the session.